Welcome everybody, my name is Krush AK and this is the Market Meditations Podcast. We chat with fascinating people from around the world to extract mindsets, routines, stories and habits to help you build richer lives. Meditators, today we have on channel Wang. If you're an investor, entrepreneur or trader, you absolutely do not want to miss this episode because he is extremely successful at all free. He was previously a quant trader, moved on to build Mazari, which is pretty much the Bloomberg of crypto, and now has the DeFi Alliance where he helps crypto startups in the space. It's incredible and I hope you enjoy this episode. Before we jump into this episode, don't forget that I send hand-picked market news, insights and education to over 6,000 traders and investors three times a week. To get access to this, all you have to do is sign up to kurushak.substack.com. Meditators, welcome to another edition of the Market Meditations podcast. Today, I have an incredible guest, far more knowledgeable than me on all things crypto and blockchain. So I'm so excited to dive in and learn from him. He's also an extremely successful entrepreneur. We're going to break down his journey, go into his entrepreneurial side, his investing side, his trading side, and learn as much as we can. Chao Wang, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Well, um, would you be so kind as to give us a little bit about your background? Um, maybe start before what happened on your Mazari journey, and then we can start talking about how you managed to build such an incredibly successful business in the cryptocurrency space. Yeah, um, I so I was a trader, uh, quant trading. I did quant trading for almost 10 years, um, traded U.S. equities, um, you know, in, in futures, cash, uh, ETFs, you know, a bunch of different like algorithmic strategies. Um, I, I did that at two different places in Chicago and New York. Uh, they're both like super low profile, but actually really, really big. Um, they're like maybe two to 5% of the entire US stock market in terms of trading volume. Wow. Um, so that's like, like maybe over a trillion dollars. Of trading volume per year. Chow, if I can just dive in right there, I'm interrupting you already. Right. I'm going to do this so much because right. um, I want to learn as much as possible. What do you mean? Why would they be low key if they're trading so much? What makes a firm want to be high key versus low key? I guess there there are maybe a couple of reasons. One is uh, they don't. They're generally prop trading firms, so they don't take outside capital, so they don't need to do any marketing, right? Because they just trade their own capital. Uh, the downside of that is, um, in terms of attracting talent, you might like you might be a little bit more challenging. But um, within the industry, the algorithmic trading industry, these firms are gen- generally pretty well known. So, uh, but to the general public, they're not um, uh, high profile. So the people that need to know know about it, and that's about it. Exactly, and and two, they don't want to attract the regulators because it, it's a super um, competitive. Uh, space. I mean, the, the, the lower f- time frame you go, uh, the more of a zero sum game it is, right? In terms of, of trading. So uh, it's very much a, um, like a very high, very cutthroat, uh, highly competitive kind of business. So they don't want to attract any competitors. They don't want to attract any, you know, aggressive regulations. And this was legacy markets, right? Yeah, that's uh, US equities. Uh, so yeah, please continue. No, uh, that's that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much it in terms of like. Thank like you on your journey before Mizari and yeah. leading up to it. Yeah. Um, I, I will interrupt a lot, but I will put you back on track. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I've been involved with the crypto community since maybe 20, 2012 and um, got into Bitcoin pretty early and Ethereum twenty fourteen. Um, and frankly, these are the single two most important things that that happened to to crypto. Like, I haven't seen anything as Mind blowing as Ethereum since since 2014 to be to be honest, but I mean, obviously we're going to talk about DeFi. DeFi is very uh, interesting as well, but Ethereum is like Ethereum and Bitcoin are, are zero to one basically, right? Um, but you know I've been involved with the community uh, as on, on the side professionally. I, I did trading, right? Uh, but 2018, were you were you looking at the market? as a trader or um, from a technological perspective? Did you see this as an opportunity for me to make money or was the technology exciting to you? Well, what, what attracted me to, to Bitcoin in the first place was, was the market. The, the day I learned about Bitcoin was when like Bitcoin crashed like 80% in like 20, 2011 or something. Uh, with I can't remember what, what day was that, but it was just ridiculous. And was like, what kind of shitcoin is this, right? <laughs> and And... 
that's that's how I got into uh to this market and and I mean trading was was what got got, got me into this market but um it, it took me maybe a year to really understand Bitcoin uh, as a technology um and uh, from that point out I was mainly interested as, as an investor uh, and, and focused on on the on the technology and in the applications um yeah, uh, that's 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 the that's the background. But uh, uh, to, to, sorry to, to expand on that a little bit more because you said Ethereum was the biggest thing that's happened um, since pretty much since Bitcoin. Uh, where would the current DeFi craze fit into that picture? I mean, DeFi is is basically uh, a um, I mean application of of, of that, right? Um, Obviously, it took many years. Ethereum was conceived in 2014, and it, it took basically six years for Ethereum to go live. And well, I mean, it took two years for Ethereum to go live, and, but then six years for DeFi to really um, sort of catch the attention of uh, some of the startups, some of the smartest minds uh, in within within crypto and as well as within the tech world, right? Yeah. Um, so it, I guess. In hindsight, I mean, you know, back in 2016, people thought about, um, you know, DAOs and, you know, building social media on blockchains and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but really nowadays, the only thing that really took off is, is DeFi. Um, and in hindsight, it's the most obvious application uh, of, of, uh, on Ethereum because, you know, if you think about what Bitcoin does, right, Bitcoin is, um, is a way to store some value and to transfer some value. It's very simple, but it's it's genius. And the natural next step is, you know, the question that you ask yourself is, what do you do with this value, right? You collateralize it, you borrow it, you lend it, you insure it, you trade it, right? And what is that? That's DeFi. It's just in hindsight, it's just really natural, right? But it was only enabled by by Ethereum. Uh, you cannot do a lot of these things uh, on, on on Bitcoin. Right, at least not very easily and in a completely trustless way. But you've already answered one of the um, questions I had coming up later, which was to expand on a tweet you said, which is if you understand Bitcoin, there is absolutely no excuse for not understanding DeFi as it is the next logical step. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, DeFi just it's it's very natural. It's the natural next step. Awesome. Then. Um, um, yeah. So. Uh, but yeah, you know, we started building Masari. Uh, I was part of the founding team. Uh, I basically built out the, the technical team, ran the product, the vision down to the ex execution. Uh, I spent a couple of years there. Um, well, chat, chat, too, too many, well. too many. Uh, like there's uh, so many details rushed over. So uh, you are an entrepreneur in the space and a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs. They're trying to start their own businesses. They're trying to break into crypto and they have a whole bunch of different skill sets, but um, the ideas, the processes, which you implemented, I'm sure can be applied universally. So how did you spot this gap in the market? How did the team get together? What are the specifics of that um, starting point for Mazari? Um, well, the, the original motivation was basically the 2017 ICOs, right? Um, there were, thanks to Ethereum, there has been, a, an explosion of, of tokens and assets. Um, and the, the, the problem that we saw was, um, there was a big asymmetry information asymmetry between the token issuers and, and, the, and the token investors and so what we wanted to do was to organize all this information uh, reduce this information asymmetry and provide this kind of service for uh, for you know the investors basically right um, it's, you can think of it as, as a Bloomberg uh, for crypto yeah uh, one, one that provides uh, quality data and, and research so that, that, that's, that was the opportunity that, that we saw. And so you spotted that opportunity that there's, um, well, that inefficiency in the market, efficient, um, the information isn't being communicated well or efficiently. And did you just think, let's build something to solve that? Or did you have this long-term vision of let's build the Bloomberg for crypto? Um, who came up with the idea? How did you get that team together? Well, so originally it was, uh, was Ryan's, Ryan sell his idea. Um, we, I had a similar idea. I, I didn't know him back then. And um, I, I sort of wanted to do the same thing because I, I come from a sort of financial background yeah. and um, um, it, it was just a very natural thing for, for me to think about. 
And um, I was chatting the, about this with a friend of mine, uh, another guy who's also part of the founding team. He's more technical. Um, and we got together and, and chat about this idea. And um, somehow we, we uh, got in touch with, uh, with Ryan and, and Dan, uh, the other co-founder of Masari. And uh, through Twitter, uh, Twitter is just such, such an amazing... Twitter is, the, is, is, is what LinkedIn has always meant to be. Yeah. Um, and so... I mean, it's how I got you on the podcast. Like, without Twitter, how would I have done that? Exactly. Twitter is just, it's just so amazing. Uh, but anyway, so we got together, we, we, we got in touch and got together and, and um, you know, uh, we just started building this. Yeah. And, uh, it's, so and what it's was been, that one? Been, like, you know, just build a website or make a newsletter list, start posting on Twitter? Um, so back then, Dan already built uh, on-chain FX, and, uh, which, which is a fairly well-known um, data aggregator. And so, um, you know, by the time we, we, we got together, the, the foundation has, uh, we already had a foundation. Like on-chain FX was already a fairly successful product um especially towards the end of 2017 with the, the entire ico craze right yeah of um, course but um uh the, the the challenge we've always had at masari was there there are there were so many opportunities in this space so many data sets to aggregate so many research pieces to aggregate how do we prioritize and and that has been a struggle for for almost 2 years and i think that's that's probably a struggle for many startups in, in this space because there are just so many opportunities. And I think the key there is really to focus, is, is to find um, the, the one thing that, that you should focus on for the next three to six months um, and, and really execute and really ignore everything, everything else. The, the, the struggle we had was, you know, we, we did, we built on FX, we built a, a research platform um, we also uh, gather information from token issuers, and uh, that that was a product. Uh, that was a separate product called like the registry. So we we did a lot of things, um, but ultimately, um, what we sh- probably should have done is is to pick one and and really really execute. And once you you dominate that market, you you sort of expand. And 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 that's frankly that's what sort of you know coin coin market cap did really well. I mean, people shit on coin market cap, but in terms of e- execution. Right, like they've been just amazing. They're just being focused on, on on one thing. Well, I guess two things for six years, and and those two things were basically number one, covering as many tokens as possible, and number two, covering as as many exchanges as possible. Like they basically only focus on these two things, right? And they like they, they, they were sold to Binance for four hundred million dollars or something along those lines, right? So, like my my general advice for people in in this space is just find focus, find a big op- opportunity and, and focus on it. Well, um, that's actually a position I find myself in right now because um, attention and influence in the cryptocurrency space is very uh, leverageable. You can leverage that to build businesses, to um, build podcasts, but it's difficult to know whether you should be building a huge team, reinvesting aggressively and trying to do loads of things at once or hone down and just pick one thing and be the absolute best at doing that. Do you think generally, like you'd say in most scenarios, you should be focused on one specific thing? And as a follow-up to that, what would you have focused Mazari on if you could go back right now and redo it? I mean, I think in general, you should just pick one and focus and do it for, 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 for a while. I mean... It's it's very hard to say how long you have to really focus on one thing before you give up, right? But the idea is you should you should really focus on one thing, and if it doesn't work, you pivot, rather than tr- tr- spreading your bets over too many different things. I mean, by the way, this is one thing that that really that's that really separates entrepreneurship uh, from from trading. Trading, you know, the saying goes, diversification is is the only free lunch in in trading and investing. Right. The more I have one more free lunch. Make. I have one more free lunch, which I think too many people miss out on. Tax efficiency. That's the other free l- lunch on investing and trading. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, tax and, and diversification. These are the the main um, the main things you need to think yeah. about. But what the in in, tr- in trading investing, you want to make as many independent bets as possible uh, to reduce your risk and uh, while keeping the same kind of return or increasing return by maintaining the same kind of risk. But in entrepreneurship, 
it's the exact opposite you when you want to do. You want to focus on one bet, and you want to you want to have one vision rather than having so many different see rather than seeing so many different prob- probability streams, right? Like the traders see many different prob- probability streams in the future. Entrepreneurs, founders need to see only one, and they need to will that into reality. And I, I think this is the number one difference between entrepreneurship and 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 trading. I love that probability stream visualization of this. So um, when you say entrepreneurs, are you talking about a whole team or an individual? Because a vision I had for what I'm trying to build right now is I'm trying to find talented individuals with that entrepreneurial mindset to simultaneously lead different things at once, which technically doesn't fall true to what you've said of focusing on one thing. Do you think it's better to just get every single one of them on that one goal? Or can you take that um, multi-faceted approach of pursuing those different probability streams? Yeah, I mean, there's no... It's not a black and white answer uh, to this question. I mean, it depends on how you frame it. Like, what is that one thing? Depends on how you frame it. Like, that one thing can be something really big under wh- under which you have made a different smaller things uh, that you can you can spread your your bets on. But it, it, it's case by case. One it, grand overarching vision, though. Regardless, otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, all, all these different bets that you make under that one umbrella needs to be synergistic with each other, right? Exactly. That they need to contribute this one one big vision. Do you have a, a maths background before the quant trading? I, I, I learned math. I did math in undergrad. In undergrad, same. Um, yeah. Math graduate as well. So um, I, I love that, um, that, that view of the world, the probability streams, the um, kind of objective uh, X possibility of this happening, Y probability of this yeah. happening. Yeah. Um, go ahead. So the second part to the question was, so you can go back in time right now. What would be the one thing you'd focus Mazari on? Uh, how would you have done it differently? Um, I would probably focus all our energy on, um, you know, in, in hindsight, it, it doesn't really matter what you focus on. There's just so many opportunities, right? Yeah. I mean, basically we had two major paths right one is to be a uh, data focus and the other one is to be a research focus it doesn't really matter I, I think either will work um but again i, I think that the key point is uh pick one and really focus and, and build a team around that, that vision so yeah there's no specific path you would have um tokus tr- uh, chosen true to that mathematical just um it's the same thing just focusing that energy which i absolutely love um then that actually leads quite nicely into where I was going to go next. And already I can see the wisdom one would gain as an entrepreneur from coming to you and your team. Um, Tell me about DeFi Alliance. How did that come together? Um, And maybe even a little bit background about, um, we've spoken a little bit about how you got into DeFi, but yeah, where did DeFi Alliance come from? We started DeFi Alliance uh, back in April this year. It was before the DeFi summer before the compound uh, uh, liquidity mining. And um, the original idea, which still stays true today, is, is to, uh, to unblock hurdles for DeFi startups, right? Um, so we tried to solve some very specific problems for, for DeFi. And one of the first problems that we, thought, that we saw for DeFi was, um, was uh, liquidity, right? I mean, liquidity is basically at the core of, of any DeFi platform, right? Um, so, um, and the, the thing that we saw with most of the DeFi products was, you know, there are some, uh, retail liquidities, but there has never been any real institutional liquidity. I mean, you don't want to, at the end of the day, DeFi is built for, you know, the, the, the individuals, uh, like, like, like the day-to-day users like, like ourselves, but, um, you want different types of liquidity. Uh, that you want to mix different types of liquidity, including retail and institutional, in one platform so that they can sort of um, contribute to, to each other. They can sort of like be, be like produce synergies with each other. But like if you look at the, the traditional markets, um, the professional liquidity, mar- uh, liquidity providers, um, 
they've done one thing basically over the last 20 years, which is to reduce the spread, uh, which in turn basically means reducing the, um, the transaction cost. And the ultimate uh, beneficiary of that is the retail yeah. traders, right? So there is a lot of synergy between the two. So um, you, you want to, so what we, you know, bring back to, bring this back to DeFi. I think um, we can make DeFi a lot better by uh, bringing in uh, both uh, institutional uh, liquidity providers and retail users. So that, that was the original, uh, you know, motivation behind the DeFi lines. Uh, so we brought, you know, jump trading, DRW, CMT uh, together, and, the, and these were the the, the family members of, of the DeFi lines, and they're basically some of the best uh, liquidity providers, market makers in the world in traditional markets. They're also very active in in crypto. Incredible. Um, so you know, and and the first thing we launched was an accelerator program, where uh, we got the DeFi startups and these liquidity providers together, connect them. Uh, share knowledge um, on both sides, right? Like the, the liquidity providers, they, they want to learn about DeFi. They don't want to miss out on, on these on this opportunity. And the DeFi startups, they want some kind of institutional liquidity, right? So we brought them together and and we formed this uh, accelerator program. And in the first cohort, we had Synthetics, Zero uh, X, Kyber, and and three others. The second one, we had um, ten, uh, 12 startups. Uh, again, some of the top. Um, founders and and um, and projects in, in this space. Chow, can I jump in? Because um, this is already um, mind blowing. Like you're saying it so casually, but what you've done is incredible. How did you build the network to be able to bring these two parties together? How did you? Was this primarily you that brought these two together, or was it everyone's connections combined? Would these connections come from Mazari? Yeah. Uh, again, I, I don't want to take credit for for. A, what other, my it, it was primarily my my co lead uh, Imran who who did uh, all of this uh, at the beginning. Um, he basically, I mean, we're, we're both in Chicago, and all these trading firms are in Chicago. So that so this network basically is was just was very natural uh, for us. Like uh, you know, Chicago is is basically is a, is probably accountable for thirty to fifty percent of the entire. Um, you know all the liquidity in the world, right? Like what? Like literally, literally the the market making all, all the liquidity are you know, the vast majority of the liquidity in, in traditional markets are are provided by these uh, Chicago based uh, trading firms. So it, you know that the network is was has has been there, and um, you know Imran was also very deep in in DeFi. So not just crypto liquidity, the liquidity in the world. Yeah, mind blowing. Legacy markets. Yeah, uh, and you never hear about these firms because, uh, like I said before, they want to stay really low key. Um, but they trade a lot of volume. Uh, but anyway, so um, it, it was pretty natural, and um, and you know, fortunately, we <laughs> luckily we, we we saw instant market product market fit right between the. Uh, the trading firms in the in the startups. Um, what do you mean by product market fit exactly, and how does one develop an ability to spot product market fit? This is a really good question. Um, I think a lot of times product market fit is just um, it's just lightning strikes the bottle. Uh, it, it's it's pure luck, um, but. A, a good idea, a great idea is always a necessary condition for product market fit, but it's not necessarily, it's not a sufficient condition. Okay. So you need a great idea and a lot of luck, I think, in my opinion. Um, and a lot of, obviously, a lot of iteration. Because sometimes you can have a really good idea, but the, your first iteration, your v, V0 doesn't necessarily work. It almost never works. Um and you, you iterate, you iterate, and you get feedback. You know, you, you roll out a, a new version of your product, um, and you know, re you release it uh, into the market. You get some feedback from users, and then you find some problems in, in your design, and you go back and change a little bit. So it's a con constant iteration. And um, at some point, the lining might strike the bottom. To and so, come back to what you were saying earlier about why it's different to trading, because if you enter a trading position, 
you can't just continually pivot because you take such a big loss. But with a business idea, if you're focused in one path and it's not the right path, you can just pivot until you find that lightning bottle strike, as you put it, and potentially see the hockey stick growth to confirm that um, product market fit. I would argue that uh, there is actually similarity between the two in, in this regard, okay. because when you, when you trade, you, you tend to, I mean, so for, for, me, I, for me, I come from an algorithmic trading background, so it's easier for me because I can backtest, I can back to, backtest my strategies. And I can, like once I have an algorithm that, that works in backtest, I can roll it out into the market and see how it works. And if it works, great. If it doesn't work, then I come back and, and, uh, and tweak my algo, right? So again, it's, it's a constant iteration between um, my, my design and, and feedback from, from the market. But that's not execution. That's like the planning. That would be compared, say, to um, the planning of the business rather than putting it. Because once you invest the time, I view that as investing your trading capital. No, uh, you actually do execute because you need real money. You, you need okay. to you need to test and prod. You, you you don't you don't you don't you don't trade in in a simulation environment because a lot of the times your backtest does not necessarily agree with with the real production environment, uh, or or the other way around. The, the production environment doesn't agree with your backtest, so you need to go back and change your backtest. Um, so, and the only way to do that properly is to test with, with real money, but not, not a lot, like just you slowly scale up. Right. And, um, and it, it, I think in that regard, it's the same thing as, as building a start, startup. It's exactly the same thing. I, I would argue discretion and trading. I think, uh, it's slightly more difficult because I mean, it depends on your strategy. If you trade very often, you can apply the same methodology, right? Like you, you go for a strategy, you test it in prod with real money, and you, you try to see if it works. Um, you, you really have to use real money to, 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 test, to, to test your strategy because the, the, higher t the lower time frame you trade, the more marketing impact and transaction costs you may have. So you really need to trade with real money to, to understand, to know if your strategy works. And then you can apply the same methodology. You go back and, and think about, uh, you, know, you, you analyze your trades. Has it been working uh, or not? If, if it works, you know, double, double down. Otherwise, you know, reiterate. Interesting question. Um, what would you say your average cost per system developed is or was when you were what developing? You so uh, you said there's a certain financial cost that comes with testing these systems. Is that a heavy cost or is it yeah. mainly time? It's mainly time, I would say. I mean, you don't need to spend a lot of money to really test a strategy a few thousand dollars, tens of thousand dollars. I mean, that's nothing compared compare to the time that, that yeah. you spend. And you can be uh, fairly conserv conservative in terms of like slowly scaling up the, the amount of money that you, that you put in, in the production environment. Um, I mean, and, and you can put in some reasonable risk parameters to, to limit the downside, right? So I would say it's mainly at the time. Not uh, then money. where I'd go next with that is how do you determine that rate of increasing? And then as you size up, do you still have to iterate your algos? Um, is alpha decay something you've experienced throughout your trading the career? Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to constantly reiterate. Like even after you, you've reached your max capacity, which again is very subjective, um, you need, there's always new things to do, new alphas to find, new uh, ways to ex execute your, your, your alphas. Um, so there's always um, uh, a lot of things to do. And again, like I said, the, the, higher the, the higher frequency you trade, the more, the faster you have to move compared to your competitors. Because everyone at, at the end of the day are probably doing the very similar things. So it's a constant iteration. Fascinating. Then... Um coming back like scoping it back because i definitely want to talk about the trading and investing um but not quite done learning about the DeFi alliance and what you guys have done so can you potentially give us an example of the journey you took a company from the start from the moment they ca came to you to what you would determine a successful venture well so so the DeFi alliance are, are so our accelerator program is a is a eight week program um so so far, we don't, you know, um, 
you know, the, the kind of startups that, 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 that we have taken into the Accelerate program can range from a very early stage, like pre-product, uh, pre-test, even pre-test net startup, all the way to something like Kyber and Xerox with, um, you know, reasonable product market fit, right? So it, it really ranges, uh, it's, it's across the entire spectrum. Um, but the accelerator program itself is an eight-week program, and it, it's, it, it follows a very a predetermined schedule, uh, you know, with um, um, mentors from like multi multi coin, um, uh, optimism, you know, Delphi, and so on and so forth. Uh, they all have different kind of um, you know expertise in different areas. So it could be in token economics, in uh, legal and, and regulatory ex- uh, areas. Uh, it could be, you know, product design, user design, et cetera, et cetera. And anyone so in your program it's, it's, just gets access to literally everything they need to run their company from zero to um, product market fit? I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, at the end of the day, success is, is you know, we are a very small part of, uh, of the success of, of a startup. It really boils down to, to, the, to the founder and the team themselves. What we provide is... Uh, useful connections and um, useful knowledge and potentially uh, some liquidity. What common traits have you noticed among the founders that do end up succeeding? It's a good question. Um, I have a few good questions occasionally. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I mean, uh, I think, you know, there's some usual suspects like, you know, great execution, charisma, and, and all that stuff. But I, I want to mention maybe uh, something that's unique about crypto is that, um, or, or DeFi in general, is that um, there are a lot of founders that come from tradi- traditional finance backgrounds, and um, they tend to apply their, their experience and knowledge. And sometimes they're not necessarily able to, to think from first principles and to be really open-minded uh, about uh, towards DeFi because DeFi is, is a completely new thing, completely new tech stack. It, in theory, enables new things, novel things that cannot be built uh, in the traditional legacy markets. So the kind of founders that, that, that I've found generally uh, succeed in DeFi are those who uh, were actually you know, able to do this, uh, to be open-minded and, and to think from first principles, to really think about what the users want. Could you expand on think from first principles for um, our listeners? Well, I can give you an example. Uh, and and it, this is something personal. Um, I About a year ago, I um, uh, maybe up until like this summer, I, I was very bearish on, on Uniswap. And um, I just thought the AMM model wouldn't work. Uh, because it does not enable uh, professional market makers. Um, you know, uh, you know how the AMMs work. Um, you you cannot very easily change the fee in real time, uh, which could potentially cause a lot of adverse selection for for the market makers. Right. So market makers can can, can can lose money because the fee isn't high enough to to compensate for for the for the uh, for the takers for the toxicity of the takers. Um, so, uh, you know, I was bearish on that, um, but, uh, and I, I was proven wrong, very wrong, totally wrong, completely wrong this summer, right? And, you know, this is one of the things that, that I think uh, it, it, it's a really good lesson for myself and it's a good lesson for founders coming from traditional finance um, is um, don't overly rely on your past ex- experience. Think about, you know, things like AMMs, liquidity pools, you know, uh, flash loans from first principles. Why would they, like, at least ask your question, ask, ask yourself the question is, why, why would they work? Why not, right? The question is, why not? And so that, that's what I meant by thinking from first principles and, and being open-minded. Uh, so just to double down on and leverage the example you've just given, um, your focus was on just a couple isolated reasons why you thought it wouldn't work and you weren't focused enough on the, the reasons it would work, correct? Yeah. 
That's correct. Okay, fantastic. Then uh, it kind of, as a trait, that comes down to humility, doesn't it? Just uh, not marrying preconceptions or biases, coming in with an open mind or beginner's mind, if you will, um, constantly trying to learn, yep. especially in such a, I can see why you doubled down on that in such a fast adapting, evolving space with new ideas and pre concepts coming up like every other week, really. Yeah. I mean, uh, I guess that's, that's also how, you know, a lot of people got lucky in, in Bitcoin and Ethereum got lucky because they didn't have too much preconceived notion of how money works or how decentralized computing should work. And they just thought this thing is so interesting. It's fundamentally uh, novel. Uh, it just feels very different. That's a first mover advantage, isn't it? Because people, it's part of that advantage because people don't, they, you can't have preconceptions because it is the first mover. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. Then um, I think this is a perfect transition uh, as we're talking, uh, as we've covered awesome principles on what makes a good founder, a good entrepreneur, um, traits which will make them successful. Uh, where I'd go to next is, oh, no, there was one point I forgot to cover, and that is one of your tweets. The last one on the topic of entrepreneurship and Mizari and DeFi Alliance. You said you spent 30 hours a week helping DeFi startups for free, but there were two asterisks around the for free, and I wanted to know what that those asterisks meant. Uh, no, the, those asterisks were, were just... Uh, asterisks in, in this context just meant bold. <laughs> Um, I just want, I wanted to emphasize the, the fact that I, I did this, uh, we did this for, for free. Um, um, I mean, the, the DeFi Alliance, we're not, we're not monetizing, at least we're not monetizing yet. Um, so we really spend a lot of time like trying to understand the problems for, for our startups and, and help them. And we really just want to push the, the industry forward. Um, is that... Yeah, um, just so the reasoning is simply because you believe in DeFi, you believe in crypto, and you want to help the industry move forward. There's no um, business plan or game over there. There, we're thinking about potentially monetizing uh, in, in the near future by you know potentially like raising some kind of uh, um, accelerator fund. Um, and but but again, the idea is there is is to align incentives between the startups and, and the market makers, yeah, and, and the other members of the alliance. Um, but um, I mean, so far we've basically been doing all this work for half a year for free, and uh, and, and it's not just myself; it's also uh, all the members of the alliance who contributed as as mentors. They all did, did this for free. I mean, obviously, it's it's in, it's everyone's best interest to do this. I mean, for, for investors, they get the deal flow. For market makers, they get to learn about the startups. Um, same thing for for myself and and, and my colleague uh, Imran. Um, right. But, yeah. Um, but other than that, we're, we're we're not making any money. We're we're doing we're trying to do this uh, to just to push the industry forward. I love that. Absolutely love that. And often find uh, giving value without expectation, you end up getting back like ten x what you expect in ninety nine percent of cases. Uh, so definitely understand the reasoning behind that. Now we're going to do a quick segment on trading because we touched on it earlier, um, and then we'll transition on into investing because I want to dive into your mind, how you invest, how you use your mathematical, logical reasoning and thinking from first principles to develop investment thesis. So for trading, do you, I know you worked at Tower Research and you said you worked at two different places for your quant trading. Do you do any personal trading? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've always done that. Um, and how do they differ? Well, primarily, so, I mean, personal training is, is more discretionary. Um, it, it's not algorithm, algorithm, algorithmic. <laughs> so, um, and I also do a lot of investing, long-term investing. Uh, so your personal trading, um, when you say discretionary, uh, what sort of time frames are you trading? Uh, what sort of markets are you trading? Given your professional work was legacy, is it legacy here, crypto here? It depends. I mean, nowadays, I, I, I'm just completely focused on, on crypto. But earlier this year, when COVID happened, I was just so fascinated, so obsessed with the, with the macro uh, markets. Like I, I traded a bunch of shit <laughs> in, in, in the first half of the year, like oil and 
corn and and bonds and and stocks and and foreign exchange all the, all this stuff um but uh uh but starting in, in june i got bored and uh and uh you know compound, compound launched their in, incentive mining um uh program and so i started focusing on, on crypto again um so uh i mean there there's a lot of opportunities and and crypto i mean as a trader you have to think about you know whether or not you have an edge in, in, in this game. And um, in the first half of the year, when COVID happened, uh, I, I did think I had an edge in, in the macro markets because people just couldn't understand the, 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 the exponential growth of, of, uh, of you know, a, a virus, of a pandemic. Yeah. Uh, it's, the market was just so retarded. <laughs> I mean, it's just unbelievable. And, and, but then after that, um, once everyone learned about COVID, I felt like I don't have an edge in this game anymore. Like the, the, the game was basically dominated by some of the largest macro in, investors who, who spent all their time trying to analyze a bunch of data. I just had no edge in this game. So I, I went back. So despite to thinking you had an edge, um, you weren't able to successfully execute it? I did successfully execute my, my knowledge of, uh, of, of COVID. But after that, I, I just transitioned. Oh, I, nice, I just felt... Nice. I had no, I had no, no edge in this game. Um, how does one determine whether or not they have an edge? Because uh, for me personally, when I develop a trading system, I just back to, I mean, going back to when I first started, it was just manual back testing over a long period of time. Then, um, like you mentioned before, execute it in the market and slowly scale up position size. Um, but that works pretty well for systematic processes, but the more you incorporate discretion into it, the less significance I feel past data and back testing has. Also, the sample size of data you can get is a lot smaller, so um, like the variance becomes huge as to like how accurate your data actually is. So, how do you determine if whether or not you have an edge? Is that also discretionary? Do you use um, logical reasoning to think uh, it's very probable that I know more about other people than this? How do you come to that binary decision of yes, I have an edge, I should execute? Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a very. Uh, it's not again. There's no black and white answer. Um, I, I just felt I have an edge because I've been following this market for eight years. The average trader in this market probably, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. A lot of people just got com completely blew up in earlier this year in March. And so I don't, I don't know what the average, average um, uh, age of, of, uh, or experience of traders in this market. Uh, much, much, much smaller, much uh, lower than eight years. Um, and, uh, you know, that's probably one important uh, data point. And the other one is, like, I look at this all day. I mean, I'm, I'm, crypto is the only thing I really look at. I mean, not just from a market point of view. But also, like from investing and, and uh, startup, and you know, uh, from a tech point of view, uh, I, I think it's it's very it's very it's a great place to be a generalist and um, and you know be, be able to understand a, a different uh, different areas, uh, different applications, both both from applications to tech, but also different styles of of trading and investing, both like ranging from the very short term to very long term. So. Um, uh, I mean, the, the more you look at this, the more you talk to people, the, the better understanding you develop uh, for the market. So it's crazy how that is an edge, because when you take a look at the legacy markets, like if you say, I live and breathe the legacy markets, I'm always keeping up to date on the news and new events. It's like not even a thing. But in crypto, that's uh, like it, it is rare because there aren't that many people doing it. And partially why um, I've heard you say a few times that crypto is a market where retail can actually succeed trading. Uh, could you expand upon that? I mean, I, I just I just see so many people, so many young people in their 20s, sometimes drop out who are doing really well as, as traders in, in, in this market. So, I mean, there's so many examples of this, right? Like go on Twitter, like all these, some of the, some of the best, um, you know, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, they're influencers, but they're also like really good risk takers. They're, they're in their twenties. Um, they are able to think about this from first principles and they're, and also this, this, this is a game where, uh, you know, probably everyone has, um, uh, like no one has significant edge over others because this is just such a new thing. 
So the more time you spend on this, the, 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 the more edge you can develop. I find um, the only significant edge, which um, like I've spoken about this a few times on the podcast, if you build yourself a network and you can do this on Twitter, uh, you get um, more of an edge than people who don't because you're speaking to the CEOs of projects. You know what is going on in the space. And that's really probably one you have on another level. And I'm sure um, leads to really successful trading execution. I mean, that's one edge I can think of. That, that, that's a really good point. I mean, uh, being able to talk to a lot of smart people, understanding their views, especially how, they, how their views differ from yours, is really important. And one way to do that is um, share your own views, right? Um, post interesting things. And nowadays, I post less and less interesting things. I post a lot. A lot. But early on, I, I, I post a lot of like, my own insights and, and stuff. And that's how you uh, develop a, a, an audience. Um, like basically like your, what yourself does, right? Like you, you, you do all this podcasting, right? And you share knowledge, you, you bring on uh, interesting people to your podcast. So uh, in return, you get, uh, uh, you get to learn their views. And you get to talk to some of the most uh, interesting people in, in, in this space. For sure, edges can be found absolutely everywhere. Too many people get absorbed in just focusing on the fundamentals or just focusing on the price data and the charts. And that, like, you can specialize and double down on it, but there really is no reason not to be, like you said earlier, a generalist with it. Because in crypto, the information is so publicly available that um, being a generalist is a huge advantage. Uh, now. The next part to my question is a lot of people can do retail trading, but should they? I guess if you want to do this, um, you really have to do this full time. Uh, it's the only way you can develop and maintain an edge over time. Uh, you can, I mean, by, by, by trading, I mean specifically short term, because generally speaking, the shorter term you do, uh, the more competitive it is. Um, if you want to focus just on investing, like long-term investing, I don't think you have to do this full-time. Uh, you can spend your weekend uh, learning about the, the space and you can develop pretty good understanding and an edge. Um, um, but uh, short-term, I, I would say you have to do, you have to do this full-time. Otherwise, don't do it. I fully agree with that. And um, I probably add another section to it where um, with trading, you have to have a base mathematical understanding. You have to have some sort of understanding of, like, because I, I, I do a lot of educational content. It's free on YouTube. And what I get is new people, newer traders who come from all sorts of backgrounds. And there are a disturbing number of people that have no understanding of percentages, of ratios, um, or all of these basic concepts that you need to understand, or even averages. They're, they're using moving averages, but they don't know what an average is. So it it leads to just such a huge disadvantage that in those ca cases, even if you were full-time, you need to go take a step back and learn those basic mathematical concepts, um, even just like a full high school education of mathematics, and then dive into the trading. Uh, it's that self-awareness of knowing you can't do that. And that, again, leads quite nicely into another question. I've heard you say before that leverage is bad for the crypto space uh, in general. And... I often, I, I mean, I use leverage. I love to use leverage to mitigate counterparty risk, and it serves a great role in that scenario. But do you think the issue is leverage itself or the education around leverage? I guess it's both. Um, and what I meant by leverage is bad, uh, I meant specifically ex excessive leverage, okay. not like, you know, Two, three X leverage, I think it's fine. But if you go hundred X leverage, I think it's, it's, it's just terrible. And it just causes a lot of unnecessary volatility. And, um, you know, again, this is a very philosophical question. Like, do you want a free market or do you want at least some sort of, um, you know, protection for, for investors? Right. If you want a completely free market, then there shouldn't be any um, restriction on, on leverage. Because if people blow up their account, they will learn their lesson. That, that's the that's the hope, and that's the problem. But um, I think in practice, you probably want a mix of both. 
uh, you don't want to restrict, you don't want to put in too much restriction on, uh, for instance, leverage and or other parameters. But at the same time, it's it's an educational problem for for uh, for investors and traders. Um, fantastic. And Chow, that covers everything I had for the trading part, which moves us on to the last segment, which I'm, again, crazy excited for. That is investing. Um, so we've seen the trading side of you. Now let's dive into that long-term investing side. Uh, I'll begin with uh, by reading out one of your tweets, if that's okay, and then uh, get you to expand on it a bit. Um, one bull market to learn the lesson. Second bull market to make retirement money. Third bull market to ask not what crypto can do for you, uh, but what you can do for crypto. What about it? That tweet. It's, it's, it's a, it's a shit post. <laughs> well, that was a shit post. That was. A, I thought that was you saying I've made fuck you money, and now it's time to um, help crypto. Yeah, I mean that's well, I'm, that's basically what I'm doing. I mean it's <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a half it's half shit post and half. You know, I guess. Uh, I mean, the, the the thing is, um, I think a lot of people won't make it in, in the first in their first first bull market. Uh, they will learn a lot of lessons in terms of like risk taking and uh, when to get out. Um, but uh, some people will learn the lesson and apply them properly in the second bull market. Um, hopefully, they do. And then the third one is, I mean, I, I just know a lot of OGs who are working basically for free for, for this, for this space, building things that not, not for money, but really help uh, push the industry forward. I mean, with eight so. years in the space, it'd be hard to not. And I, I love that you said it was a shit post because that's why you're one of my favorite accounts to follow on Twitter. That blend of shit post with elements of truth to just appeal to absolutely everyone. It's an art. And um, <laughs> it, it, honestly, it's not just me. There were so many traders who just say Chow Wang is my absolute favorite Twitter account to follow for that exact reason. Uh, so let, let's go on to another tweet. Um, and this one comes more to a, a more specific investing one, a little less shit post. Um, I know you spoke about spotting early bull market trends for Bitcoin, uh, specifically when we had a lot of bad news come out for Bitcoin and Bitcoin not react to it. Is this apl applicable to every market? Is this a crypto specific thing? And is this actual actionable information or more just an observation? I'm not an expert in other markets except for equities, but I think this is generally true uh, in in most markets. Uh, the like, I, th I think the, the the idea behind that is whenever you have a bad news and the market doesn't react, it just means that the 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 weak hands have been shaken out, and we're only left with uh, long term uh, investors. So that's generally a a good sign. I think it's generally true. Um, and the other thing I want to see at the beginning of bull market is some sort of trend. Uh, uh, like trends always exist in, in markets and trends. I, I love trends. I love trend following. And if you can, the general, general trend following strategies, they don't, their, their win rate is less than 50% because uh, most of the time there's a lot of mean reversion. But the, the winning trades, they, it, it's an asymmetric, asymmetric trade. Um, when you when you catch the beginning of a trend, you can make a lot of money. And if you can combine a trend with some understanding of the fundamentals, some observation about whether or not the market reacts to bad news, I think you can bring your, your win rate to maybe 50 50 percent. And then again, it stays as an asymmetric trade. So when you win, you can make a lot more. What sort of time frames are we talking here? And um, when you do catch the right trend, how do you scale out? How do you decide when to exit? I think trends can range from anything from uh, maybe hours, but definitely uh, weeks, months, years. Um, generally, the longer the time frame, the more trend following the market uh, behaves. The, the, the more short term, like the more intraday, the, the, the more mean reverting the market is. That's just the general market behavior. Then, um, where do you think we are right now with regards to Bitcoin? Because I know you said on one tweet you're expecting a wide range, anywhere from 25k to 50k for this current cycle. Yeah. Um, where do you think we are yeah. right now? Have you changed your view at all? There, um, it was only four days ago, well, but so much happens in this market. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that tweet turned out to be wrong because I was expecting not a uh, a dip like what we had last night. 
and 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 it happened. Um, but it, it's not unexpected. Uh, th- there was a lot of leverage in, in the system. The question is, you, you, like the problem is, you never know when the leverage will uh, will get deleveraged. But it happened. So uh, I don't think we'll see a blow off top anytime soon. In, in the uh, like, given what just happened. Um, but what just happened is is very healthy. Um, it, uh, we, 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 I much prefer a slower bull market and then something that, that goes to like 50 next month, right? It, it's not very healthy. But uh, I think what happened last night was very healthy. I think the leverage basically got back to um, to a very healthy level. Um, if you look at the, the, the open interest, uh, to the, like today's open interest to like when Bitcoin was at like maybe 12, um, the open interest today is much lower in, in BTC yeah. terms. Um, so I think it's it's healthy. It's a, it's a very healthy deal. Well, that's good to hear. And I'm with you because I am in crypto for the long game. I'm building, um, I'm doubling down 110%. Not only do I trade it, I invest in it. I'm building businesses in it. So um, I'm with you on the slow, steady rise. And this leads to the final part of our investing uh, deep dive. And that is in your own personal investing philosophy. How do you distribute your wealth? Um, what strategies do you use? And uh, what are your long-term goals with it? I'm not really. I'm not that careful with my own investing, to be honest. Like I'm, I'm, I'm taking a lot of risk in, in crypto, and um, and it's very volatile. Um, it's not something. It's not something that that most people should do. Uh, it, it's it's a little bit reckless. <laughs> to be honest, guess, but I think twenty four have given me that answer. <laughs> yeah. So I mean. But I'm I'm just irrationally bullish about about this this market and, and this space. So um, how do you invest that irrational bullishness? Is that in Bitcoin? I know you have um, changed not changing, but um, you're not as confident as you once were in Ethereum, given what's happened with stable coins. So how do you get that exposure to crypto in the space? I mean, my my view about Ethereum changes all the time, just because Ethereum is is it cha- Ethereum yeah. itself changes all the time. <laughs> So there's always new information that comes in. Um, I'm I'm more slightly more bullish on Bitcoin and on Ethereum, um, just because um, I, you know I think Bitcoin is, is the shelling point uh, for crypto for store value. It's very hard to have two uh, equally massive store value assets. I think that the number one will be worth a lot more than the second one, but. I'm all, but again, like I'm, I'm bullish on Ethereum. It just, it's just that I'm more bullish on, on, on Bitcoin. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm mostly Bitcoin, uh, maybe 20, 25% Ethereum and the rest in, in DeFi. And um, it, so mostly Bitcoin, like 70% Bitcoin, about 25% and that final 5% more speculative, diversified against potential home runs on DeFi. Something along those lines, but again, like the ratio can change all the time just because the, the price changes. <laughs> very um, yeah. If someone is looking to get DeFi exposure but doesn't have the knowledge or network you do, what do you think is the best way to build that exposure? <sighs> I mean, my honest answer is don't touch DeFi. <laughs> That's a great answer. Uh, if you. Uh, if you if you haven't spent enough time trying to really trying to understand it, because um, I feel like a lot of most of DeFi assets are um, like the market has not come to consensus around how much they should be worth. Um, I mean, Ave is is almost one bill synthetics Ave. They're all, all almost one billion dollars. Why why is that valuation justified? Right. I mean, I think they will go up. In this bull market, but why? Like, why is is one billion a fair valuation? Right? Like, no one can really answer that that question, other than the fact that you know there is a lot of money sitting on the sidelines, willing to to buy the dip, right? So, it's it's a very risky investment. It's much much riskier than than uh, than Ethereum, let alone. So most Bitcoin. people should just stick to that Bitcoin Ethereum split, and that's the best way to get crypto exposure. In your non financial advice opinion. I, I think I think that's that's true. Uh, even if I'm I'm a I'm a DeFi bull part, <laughs> uh, I, I I don't re- recommend people to to really touch the these assets unless we're like 
unless they've spent enough time really uh, trying to understand. Chow true to your Twitter, you have mixed shit posting with absolute alpha leak and um, nuggets of wisdom all over. Thank you so much for your time. It honestly means the world to me and our listeners that you have taken an hour out of your extremely valuable day to um, come on and chat to us. Is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners with other than a goodbye before we wrap this episode up? I have nothing to promote. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, feel free to DM me on Twitter. So uh, Thank you it. so much. And that is the end of this episode of the Market Meditations podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Market Meditations podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like us to continue bringing you fascinating people from across the world, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you like to listen to these podcasts and share the episode with a friend. If you have feedback or an idea for a potential guest, reach out to me on Twitter at Karush AK. And do not forget, we write a newsletter covering all important topics in crypto and traditional markets. We send it out three times a week the Market Meditations newsletter. You also get early access to these episodes and you get transcripts and extra notes as well. So make sure to subscribe there as well.